morning. Thank you, John, for that introduction. Of course, none of it is true. Um, I want you to know I write biographies of black lives. I write honestly about race for young readers, in spite of the current backlash that by doing so, I make readers like you less patriotic. I write about race in American history because I am a grandson of a man who was once enslaved. My parents' lives were Jim Crow restricted. When I was your age, I witnessed the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. And finally, through efforts and sacrifice, I have benefited from the country's extraordinary change in race-based policies and practices. In short, racial policies and attitudes have had a major impact on my life. But in the words of the 44th president, my identity might begin with the fact of my race, but it didn't and couldn't end in there. I think of my books as public diaries of what it was like to be black before the 21st century. I celebrate that progress, although it was slow and bloody. It has made a difference, a dramatic difference in my children's lives compared to my parents. And my grandchildren when they're old enough to read my books, will think that I write about ancient history until they bump up against the remnants of racial arrogance that lurks like dust bunnies in a clean closet. Last weekend's football game in Georgetown is a good example. And I want my writings to give my grandchildren context to understand such throwbacks of racial rudeness and to move beyond them. I write to give them a fact-based American history, not nostalgia dictated by dreamers of a false past. And I write so that your generation can acknowledge our fact-based history and celebrate the now. You can find comfort in what has been accomplished. See how far we have progressed on this stony road called race and how much farther we have to go. Although writing for young readers about race has its own particular challenges, as a writer, I face even a greater challenge than my subject matter. And it is the same challenge that you face when you write for your, your class assignments or college application essay. It is not what you write, but how you write, how you tell a familiar story in a fresh way. The challenge is not the writing craft. Craft can be learned with time and practice. It is about being faithful to yourself, digging deeper to find a new, your way to tell a familiar story in a new way. Your teachers have read hundreds of essays on the topic that they've assigned. How do you surprise them? The college admissions officer will read thousands of personal and supplemental essays from applicants who are as bright and as educated as you are. How do you stand out? Your challenge is not your topic. It's making your writing fresh and insightful, creating something that is individualistic as your fingerprint. Finding what comes, 
finding that comes through quiet reflection, chapel-like meditation, even if it's in a noisy coffee shop, under a tree, or late at night, watching the moon dance with the clouds. It does not come from countless hours of screen time, having your ideas sheep herded by automated algorithms. Let me share my attempt to take a familiar story and tell it in a novel way. As I said, I write nonfiction about the black experience. What could be more familiar than Martin Luther King Jr.? You read of his accomplishments in fifth, eighth, and 11th grade American history. You get a long weekend off on his birthday in January, and he sticks around for February's Black History Month like a house guest who has overstayed his welcome. Let me see if I can freshen him up for you. This is from a book that I finished this summer. It's a lyrical biography of race in America. Dinner for six in a warm black home. At the head of the table, Daddy King saw something amiss. Five-year-old Martin distressed. His older sister knew why. His baby brother too young to care. Mother and grandmother sensed their little boy's pain, but waited for Daddy King to ask Martin to explain. His best friend since three had reached an age when he could no longer play. One school for blacks, one another for whites was the law. The friend's father, local grocer, would not let his son keep a friend outside the color lane. Daddy King spoke of forgiveness, quoted the Bible, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Young Martin let his peace turn cold, his daddy's idea too odd and old. Forgive the man who took his friend away. Martin saw joy on his mother's face when a visiting minister peppered his sermon with words his preacher daddy did not use. Martin promised to make her proud one day with the words his daddy could not use. At 14, he mastered such words and more. In the double and in at the Black Elks Oratory Festival in Dublin, Georgia, Martin delivered the Negro and the Constitution. His sentences pulsed with lyrical waves that made the dictionary jealous. On the ride back to Atlanta, in the colored section of the bus, Martin basked in his oratory skills. He had told how 13 million black Americans were restricted in where they could eat, sleep, work, and learn. At the first stop, more whites boarded the bus. Martin knew he was about to take a test. He would fail. The white section was full, the colored section too. His teacher told him to stand. The driver commanded, black stand, whites sit. Martin searched for an answer in his speech, but its truth went missing. Defy his teacher, defy the driver, and be left on the highway. Martin's courage wilted. He did as the law demanded, stood for 90 miles in an angry puddle of shame. The country at war, soldiers on battlefields around the world, Connecticut tobacco farms empty of hands. Martin now 15, first time away from home, first time north worked tobacco to earn college funds in a summer of sweat and fun. On Saturdays, he and black college boys sipped Dr. Pepper at the local drugstore, ate in restaurants they could afford. No rules or customs kept them at bay. 
The rest of the week, Martin and his exhausted friends laughed themselves to sleep with exaggerated stories of sports and girls. The summer, the summer of sweat and fun over, tobacco weave tied and stored. Martin headed home, rode from Hartford, D.C. in an integrated train, then rode in a Jim Crow segregated train all points south. Hungry and without a shoebox of Mama King's fried chicken, he went to the dining car, took a seat at the white linen table with its single red carnation. The black waiter shook his head. The white steward in a swirl of disdainful gestures moved Martin behind a gray curtain. Eating with whites in the same space was against the law. On the long bus ride after his speech, Martin knew in his mind where he wanted his body to be. Returning home on a Jim Crow train, the same shame coated by color. Martin Luther King Jr., age 15, left for college. At 19, became a minister, but was unsure how to challenge the forces that locked him behind a curtain of hate. This is my attempt to make the familiar new and fresh, and to give the reader what I hope is a compelling story. In your writing, whatever the purpose, class assignment, college application, or a breakthrough graphic novel, let your writing sparkle with you, the spirit you discover deep within yourself. Thank you. <laughs>